Thanks, Lucy, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. The Bureau of Meteorology very much highly values its connections with ABARES and DAF. We work very closely with both organisations. And of course, the agricultural and primary industry sector are key stakeholders for the Bureau, so it's a real great pleasure for me to be here representing the Bureau this afternoon. Before we begin, uh, if you will allow me an advertisement, our annual climate statement, uh, our annual climate summary rather, has just been released. Uh, it's available now on the web uh, as a downloadable PDF, but also we now have a highlight video. We're moving more into the, uh, the use of video communication as we move into the 21st century. Uh, and one of our uh, main climate scientists is on that video, so can I commend that to you? It actually is part of our role that's showing on our stand. We had intended that hard copies would be available at our stand today, hot off the press, but apparently the press has got a bit too hot and broke down. So uh, unfortunately they won't be available. I'd like to begin with a quote from a well-known individual of history. And I'll be using a few quotes from the same person throughout the presentation. If we could first know where we are and whither we are tending, we could better judge what to do and how to do it. That really is a statement of the outline of what I want to talk about today. Where we are, uh, at the tail end of an extreme summer, at, in a decade, really, of extremes. Where are we tending? Well, where have we been in recent decades? Where are we going in coming decades? And in bringing it down more narrowly, the coming season, and meeting that challenge. So where we are, an extreme summer. These photos all taken from over the last month, the fires in Port Lincoln, the, uh, the floods uh, up in uh, towards Bundaberg, and uh, pastures out in the west of New South Wales. Temperatures. Well, the first extreme I'd like to talk about is the one that we talked, that Lucy mentioned, our media release came out on Friday, the hottest summer on record. The, uh, that's no news, I guess, to most people who have, have lived through it, but a very extreme summer. Uh, and uh, as the uh, map indicates, the yellow and orange colours are those where it's above average, and the green and blue colours are below average. And for most of Australia, as you can see, apart from the Pilbara, uh, it was exceptionally above, uh, it was an above average year. And in some areas, the tan colour, two to three degrees above average. Uh, averaged across Australia, the temperature was 28.6 degrees above the long term. And of course, as we'll, you'll recall, the most extreme of that heat occurred in the first three weeks of January. And of course, January was the hottest month on record. A feature of this summer has been heat waves. Two major widespread continental scale heat waves. The first of them actually technically wasn't in summer, it was the tail end of spring, late, uh, late November, 24th of no November to the 30th of November. And this map indicates the highest temperature that was achieved uh, in, those, in that period over Australia, with that uh, darkest brown colour being above 45 degrees. As you can see, a very significant heat wave, but in particular severe because it was so early in the season. As you'd be aware, particularly for human health and animal and plant health, when a heat wave occurs early out of season, it actually can do more damage or more harm. The second heat wave was the one I've already mentioned in January. The very first three weeks, exceptionally hot, exceptionally long, exceptionally widespread, in fact, unprecedented in our recorded history. The highest temperature was 49.6 degrees, recorded at uh, Moomba in South Australia. And overall, uh, on the 7th of January, the Australian temperature averaged over the whole continent reached 40.3 degrees, a record. And of course, with the heat came the fires. Uh, in the build up to the season, we had a, uh, an indication that it was going to be a bad season, particularly for grass fires. Two very wet years preceding had meant there had been significant grass growth and of course therefore uh, a lot of fuel, potential fuel, and of course a dry winter and spring as shown in this, uh, this diagram here indicates the, uh, was a, uh, led to the drying of that fuel, the, the, the provision of that high load. Mitch, match that with the extreme temperatures and of course the result was significant. Uh, 
and in fact, uh, very devastating fires in some locations in every state and territory. The Bureau actually uh, issues spot forecasts. When a fire starts, the fire agency asks the Bureau to produce forecasts for that location. And during January, there were a record number of such spot, spot forecasts uh, issued, over uh, 1,500 of them in the month of January, by far a record above anything we'd have to do dealt with before. So a very severe fire season. Moving from fires to tropical cyclones. And this is a uh, uh, photograph taken last week, in fact, from the uh, International Space Station uh, by the commander of the station, Chris Hadfield, showing Cyclone Rusty, just as it was approaching the Australian coastline. From space, cyclones have a majestic beauty about them, which belies the uh, awful destructiveness that they impart at the ground. Cyclone Tr Tr Rusty was, of course, just one of several cyclones this year. There were five uh, in the, that impacted in the Australian region. Uh, Mitchell, Norell, Oswald, Peter, and we don't have a Q name to use, so dropping to Rusty. This map gives uh, an indication of the tracks. The one on the uh, eastern coast, of course, was Oswald, which will feature a bit later in what I'm talking about in terms of the rainfall, and the four that were experienced over in WA, and the last one being Rusty, which made landfall uh, near Port Hedland. And of course, in addition to the east coast, uh, to the cyclones, we also had quite a significant east coast low. A, 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 a similar sort of beastie, but different, uh, and it certainly tends to impact on the east coast of Australia, as the name implies, and you'd probably be aware that that occurred in uh, late February and brought significant rainfall with it to the east coast of Australia from the surface paradise, the Gold Coast, down uh, the north coast and central coast of New South Wales in particular. Well, as I mentioned, the cyclones brought with them rain. They weren't the only cause of rain, but they were a significant cause. Very heavy December rainfall occurred in southwest Western Australia, so, and uh, Cyclone Oswald, as I mentioned, brought very heavy rainfall uh, to the east coast of uh, New South Wales, with some centres uh, recording up to 700 mils in one day and quite a number over 400. Um, the map here is what's known as a decile map. So where the colour is blue, the, uh, it's above average for that time of year. So this is the summer uh, rainfall map. So above average where it's blue, below average where it's red, and the deepest blue is highest on record, and the deepest red is lowest on record. And as you can see, um, large parts of the east coast and significant parts of Western Australia, particularly the southwest and the Pilbara, uh, above average rainfall. And that's the story I guess the media has tended to focus on and where public interest has, uh, has fallen. But of course, you can see clearly from that for most of Australia, it's actually been uh, a fairly dry summer for Victoria, Tasmania, Western New South Wales, inland Queensland, South Australia, and uh, the, the top end uh, where the monsoon was delayed and, uh, and not a very productive one in terms of rainfall. Uh, just as an aside, I'd like to uh, indicate the forecast we had for that s summer. And this is the forecast the Bureau put out. The greens and blues indicate where the chances are above, of above average rain are higher. And uh, the yellows and reds where the chance of above average rain is lower than 50%. And as you can see, we're the, the map gives indication that we there was a higher chance of rain in the east and in the west, roughly corresponding to where it fell. So this forecast wasn't too bad. And of course, with the rain came the floods. Some years, uh, some summers, summer of course is a traditional severe extreme weather season in Australia. Some years bring the fires, some years bring the floods. This year was somewhat unusual in that it brought both sometimes at the same time, uh, in different places, but sometimes at the same time across the continent. This map indicates where there were major floods over, well, the red triangles indicate major floods, the orange ones moderate, and the green triangles minor flooding. But focusing on where the major floods are, as you can see, along the uh, Pacific coast of Queensland, focusing on that southeast corner, and then also the north coast of New South Wales. Significant and major flooding. Uh, in particular, a lot of that was associated with uh, Cyclone 
Oswald, and uh, as you probably saw, remember from the cyclone track, it sort of meandered inland a bit, a bit unusual for a cyclone to do that, uh, and caused very significant rain uh, and consequent flooding along that part of uh, Queensland and into New South Wales. The Burnett River and the Clarence River uh, in that period reached record fl flood peaks. And of course, we're aware from, uh, the Bureau's aware from its observations, and I guess you're aware from the media, those, that floods have continued to occur through the month of February uh, with heavy rains from different sources. So all in all, a very, very extreme summer. So where are we? Well, the, uh, the famous poem, of course, of Dorothy McKellar talks about our droughts and flooding rain, so we know that it's been part of our history going back decades and eons that we live in a highly variable climate. But this past decade has been particularly marked by extremes of climate. Firstly, the, the decade began in the midst of the millennium drought. Uh, this graph indicates the variation from average of rainfall across the Murray-Darling Basin. So where the bar is blue, it's above average. Where the bar is down and, and red, it's below average. And the black line gives the decadal average over, that pe over the period. So as you can see, um, highly variable from year to year, uh, as uh, was noted, very variable climate. Uh, and also, if you notice the black line, that also is very highly variable. Australian climate is quite variable at the annual level, but also at the decadal level. But I'd like us to focus on this last period here, which is uh, quite distinct in the record, a very extended period of below average rain, which we now call the millennium drought, given that it occurred at the uh, turn of the millennium. The other significant periods, of course, in Australian history are around our Federation, the Federation drought, and of course, around World War II, sometimes called the World War II drought. So, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, the, the drought started in around 1997. Depending a little bit on where you were, it started that period in Victoria, it spread north a bit later. Uh, but, it, but it was ended abruptly, obviously, in 2009 by the La Niñas that we experienced. It was uh, largely limited to the southeastern part of, uh, of the continent, uh, so not, it wasn't universal over the whole of the Australian continent, and particularly uh, southeastern Australia, southeastern Queensland, and 